this conversation of which I have only recorded the most remarkable parts was the only one I ever had with Carnot. The house of Barras was open to me, and I went there so often that Carnot could not but look upon me as a man entirely devoted to the party of that director. It was, however, not so. All his speeches breathed hatred and vengeance a month before the catastrophe took place. It was secretly resolved to make it terrible, and the victims were marked out. My position and my duty forbade me taking any part in the contest, but I wrote the truth to General Bonaparte. I observed that he would tarnish his glory if he gave any support to acts of violence, which the situation of government did not justify. And nobody would pardon him if he joined the directory in their plan to overthrow the Constitution and liberty that prescriptions were about to take place against the national representation and against citizens whose virtue made them worthy of respect, that punishments would be inflicted without trial, and that the hatred resulting from such measures would extend not only to the directory, but to the whole system of Republican government. Besides, it was not certain that the party they were going to prescribe really wished the return of the Bourbons. In any case, the legal punishment and banishment of Pichigrou would be sufficient to destroy any plans of that sort. These considerations made so much impression on the mind of General Bonaparte that he soon avoided in his correspondence with the Directory all allusions to the interior situation in France and at last left off writing to them altogether. His long silence appeared strange to Barat who, however, easily guessed the cause of it. He continued seeing me, but I perceived by his gravity and the insidious questions of his favorites that he suspected me of not being his friend. I never loved equivocal situations, and I hastened to get out of the one I was in by candidly declaring my sentence to one of his confidants. I know enough, I said, of the plans of government to hurt them. If I were to acquaint their enemies with what I do know, it would, however, be an act of treason, of which you know I am incapable. But as a citizen and an honest man, I cannot dissemble that I do not approve of the coup d'etat that is meditating. You are going to trample on laws and liberty. Such a system of violence will sooner or later recoil on your own heads. After having toiled and suffered 10 years to obtain a representative government, it is distressing to reap nothing but tyranny or the convulsions of anarchy. He answered me by some commonplace observation on the necessity of striking a great blow at a faction that wanted to overthrow the republic. But Ra, to whom this conversation was reported according to my intention, thought it requisite to dissemble. He did not treat me ill. He had me watched with a vigilance that extended even to my correspondence with General Bonaparte. My letters to him were written in cipher, and that proof of mystery and mistrust by augmenting their suspicions contributed, perhaps, to hasten the catastrophe. Through the fear that Bonaparte might take some resolution that would perplex the directory, I may hear briefly describe the different members of the directorial government whose existence was so short, though its operations had so much influence on the destinies of France and the affairs of Europe. Barra, who then discharged the functions of president, was descended from one of the most ancient families of Provence, a restless disposition, and the wish to advance rapidly in the military career had induced him to go to India, where he served in a colonial regiment. Having returned to France in 1789, he declared himself in favor of the revolution, in which, however, he obtained no celebrity. Nature had refused him those qualifications which ensure success to an orator, but he had had a great deal of resolution, and his conduct at the fall of Robespierre, by bringing upon him the hatred of the Jacobins, gave him a share in the gratitude all France felt for those who had contributed to the destruction of their horrible tyranny. At the period I am now speaking of, Barat was the most violent of the three members of the directory who wished for an altercation in the councils. His hatred of Carnot was so strong that, a few days before, the 18th Fructidor, one of his confidants, to whom I made the observation that Carnot would undoubtedly find means of escaping from persecution, answered, we will kill him. He had continually 
in his mouth the most insulting expressions against those whom he suspected of being royalists. On the other hand, how is it possible to reconcile the hatred of the Bourbons and their friends with the revelations published by Fauche Burrell since the Restoration, of which Barras never denied? The above-mentioned agent of Louis XVIII had asserted that the director had consented to the plan of the Count of Lille to bring about a royalist revolution, that a formal pardon had been sent him, and an amnesty for his vote in the trial of the late king. Finally, that several millions had been promised him to make up for the loss of his rank as director. If the assertion of Fauche Burrell be true, the animosity of Barat against the Royalist Party can only be explained by the impossibility in which he found himself of accomplishing his promises, or by his grief at being obliged to share glory and the profit of a restoration with persons whom he detested and whose reputation and talents would offer the king better pledges than he could present. The conduct of Napoleon in regard to Barat during his reign may also be explained by the knowledge he had acquired of his treason. Rubel, the second director, was a lawyer from Alsatia. His name will hold but a trivial place in history. He was at that time accused of amassing his fortune with an avidity that might have procured him immense wealth. However, that charge has since been disproved in the clearest manner. After living 15 years in obscurity, Rubel died a short time ago, leaving a very middling fortune. The third director was named La Réveillère La Pau. He also was a lawyer, a reputation for unsullied integrity and talent proclaimed by four committees had caused him to be regarded as a man capable of governing the state. Carnot has used him very ill in one of his works. I believe there's a great deal of exaggeration in that picture, which is traced by resentment. Several features of it, however, approach very near to the truth. His friends and his valets used to call him the good soul, le bon homme. And he wept for joy when on the 18th Fructidor he heard that 30 legislators were to be transported to the burning sands of Cayenne. As a philosopher, he was at the head of a sect, and the theophilanthropy which he sought to propagate was nothing more than pure deism. He used to lay offerings of flowers on his altars, while poor Christian priests under his government expiated the crime of teaching their religion in dark and solitary dungeons. The only man in the council who deserved his high station and who enjoyed Undisputed respect was Carnot. At that period, he had not yet completely displayed the inflexibility of conscience and the wonderful disinterestedness that have made him hitherto inaccessible both to the seduction and to the threats and severity of power. But those who approached him admired in him a dignity of character combined with virtue and vast information entirely devoted to support the liberty and independence of his country. The turn of his mind and the unshaken firmness of his soul inspired him with the predilection for Republican government, which experience does not seem to have weakened. Being himself a stranger to all the mean passions that animate and maintain society, he did not calculate on the corruption and the vanity of his countrymen. A republic being, in his eyes, the best of all governments, he thought nothing appeared too difficult for its preservation, nor perhaps nothing too severe to ensure its triumph. This austere republican was, however, a good and amiable man in the bosom of his family. He was indulgent to weakness and error. His enemies themselves did not confound him with his cruel colleagues of the convention at the period I am speaking of. He struggled to alleviate the situation of the emigrants and ensure the tranquility of their families. He resisted all oppressive measures and wanted to establish the prosperity of the state on good laws and the benefits of peace. The ministers who formed the cabinet under this pentarchy have not been able to escape oblivion, with the exception of one of those whose name will re be recorded in history on account of the variety of parts he has acted, Monsieur de Talleyrand left France in 1792 as Bishop of Autun. 
he returned in 1796 a Republican and with all the docile modesty of a disgraced man who wishes to return to favor. He possessed a remarkable degree of talent, which was much praised by his friends. He had, however, not yet attained the fame he afterwards enjoyed as one of the most clever diplomatists of Europe. In that respect, the Directory were not in want of his services. Numerous and important treaties had been signed by obscure persons and were not the worse for that. But the vanity of the directors was flattered at having under their orders a man who had formerly been a grand seigneur, who had given more than one pledge to the revolution, had lost the right of complaining of its excesses, having himself professed all its principles, and whose suppleness of character ensured his obedience. He possessed, besides, considerable advantages over his predecessor and even over his new masters. I mean his connection with influential men in foreign countries, a strong taste for politics, and the most perfect polish of manner. Notwithstanding their rude Republican pride, the directors were sensible that in their negotiations with foreign courts, a man of birth belonging to the old monarchy might be of some use to them. When Monsieur de Talleyrand entered the ministry, dissension was at its greatest violence. He gently discarded his old friends who were struggling in the councils against the majority of the directory by feigning to believe that they all wished for the return of the Bourbons. And he remained a cool spectator of their disasters. The chief point he had in view was to keep his place and reestablish his fortune, which had been destroyed by former disorder and public events. He quickly obtained his aim from which nothing could divert him. Neither the clamor raised by his enemies nor the reproaches of his masters, to which he constantly opposed a calm, patient, and, I may almost say, a careless resignation. I have witnessed some instances of it, and I felt that ambition cannot fail to create disgust when bought at such a price. He lived on a footing of intimacy with Madame de Stael, already celebrated for her superior mind and a passion for fame, united to kindness of heart that has not been sufficiently appreciated. To say the truth, it was a little her own fault. I am convinced that she did not foresee the cruel prescriptions that oppressed the vanquished party. But I certainly never witnessed so much warmth of persecution. She undoubtedly saw nothing more in the struggle than the triumph of her political opinions. I should rather say feelings. But still, it must be acknowledged that an absence of all reflection could alone have led her to embrace so openly the part of men who trampled on liberty and national representation, the two most cherished objects of her worship. All that time she carried to enthusiasm her admiration of General Bonaparte. I saw her for the first time at Monsieur de Talleyrand's. During dinner, the praises she lavished on the conqueror of Italy had all the wildness, romance, and exaggeration of poetry. When we left the table, the company withdrew to a small room to look at the portrait of the hero. As I stepped back to let her walk in, she said, How shall I dare pass before an aide-de-camp of Bonaparte? My confusion was so great that she also felt a little of it, and our host himself laughed at us. I went to see her the next morning. Her reception was kind enough to make me return often to her house, and I do affirm that her lively imagination and her incredible activity continued unceasingly, the same up to the catastrophe. She had nothing before her eyes but the counter-revolution, the return of the Bourbons, the revenge of the emigrants, and the loss of liberty. The denouement grew at last inevitable. The rage of several parties had reached its greatest height. The journals, pamphlets, and posted bills contained the most violent provocations. The Constitution, not having left the directory space enough for defense, it resolved to overthrow all barriers. 
Still, there was wanted a celebrated general to put the plan into execution. Augereau came to their assistance. The day before he arrived from Italy, I received a letter from General Bonaparte in which he said, Augereau is going to Paris. Place no confidence in him. He has brought confusion into the army. He has a factious spirit. When I returned to Italy, I learned that the misunderstanding between the generals and the officers of the two divisions of Augereau and Bernadotte had extended to the private soldiers and that they taxed one another mutually with being Jacobins and royalists. General Augereau had openly declared for the majority of the directory. Barra, who reckoned upon him, called him to Paris and gave him the military command. Government, being once again certain of the support of the general, marked out their victims, and in the night of the 17th Fructidor, orders to arrest them were delivered. As they might have escaped in the night, it was resolved to wait till daybreak, and by a wretched contrivance worthy of a melodrama, this outrage was immediately announced by the discharge of a four-and-twenty-pounder on the platform of the Pont Neuf. The explosion broke all the windows in the neighborhood and spread dismay through the city. At eight o'clock in the morning, the director, Bartholomew, 30 members of the two councils and several writers were sent to prison. A few days afterwards, a part of France witnessed their representatives dragged along in trellised carts like wild beasts. They were taken to Rochefort and from thence to Guyenne, where the un wholesome climate proved fatal to some of these unhappy men. Several of the victims succeeded in escaping. Carnot found a refuge in the house of somebody. One of the warmest advocates of the arrest, but he was the countryman and friend of the director, and his generous soul found means to conciliate the duties of friendship with the passion of party spirit. I had passed the evening of seven, the 17th of Barra. The ill-disguised agitation of his courtiers and some words which I caught en passant taught me the secret of the night. I retired early, resolved not to show myself the next day, as I did not wish to lead anyone to suppose by my presence that General Bonaparte approved of such unheard of violence. I went, however, to Barra. On the day after, as soon as he perceived me, he called me to his closet. And then, assuming a threatening look and a tone of voice, he said, You have betrayed the Republic and your general. For the last six weeks, government has received no private letters from him. Your opinions on what is going forward are known to us, and you have undoubtedly painted our conduct under the most odious colors. I declare to you that last night the directory deliberated whether you ought not to share the fate of the conspirators that are on the road to Guyenne. Out of consideration for General Bonaparte, you shall remain free, but I have just sent off my secretary to explain to him what has happened and your conduct. I answered very coolly. You have been deceived. I never betrayed any person. The events of the 18th are calamitous. Nobody shall ever persuade me that government has a right to punish representatives of the people without trial and in contempt of the laws. I have not written anything else for the last six weeks. And if you wish to ascertain the fact here is the key of my bureau. Have my papers seized. Their examination will cover my false accusers with confusion. This moderate and firm reply, but especially my proposal, pacified him. He tried to begin an explanation, but I retired. When I returned home, I burned my correspondence. It might have exposed my general, and consequently, I could not hesitate. When that was done, I sent off, as an express, an officer of the staff who was at Paris to acquaint the general with all that had happened, and not wishing that my sudden departure should be attributed to fear, I remained eight days longer in town. I went, however, to General Egaro to inquire whether he had any commission to give me. Since he had been in Paris, he was like a man beside himself. He spoke to me of the general-in-chief with a great deal of flippancy and of the 18th Fructidor with more enthusiasm than he would have done the Battle of Arcola. Do you know, he said, that you deserve to be shot for your behavior? 
but you need not be uneasy, and you may rely on me. I thanked him with a smile, but I felt it would be useless to put his kindness to the proof, and the next day I set off for Italy.